You know, it's not too early to begin recording the need for planning for a future pandemic. But, you know, it's a hard time to think about planning your vacation when you're in the middle of having a heart attack. In that flu is still, to me, the, like I said, the number one worry because the 1918 flu virus may have killed 100 million people globally, 100 million, okay? So we do need to make people absolutely realize to change the narrative to so, say, yeah, COVID-19 is really bad. It's a terrible thing to stop having again. But also, let's not forget influenza because it, it's probably caused more you know, misery during the 20th century than, than anything else. One of the challenges we're going to have going forward in convincing the world that we need to respond to this specific uh, threat of the influenza pandemic uh, has to be flavored by what we've experienced with this pandemic. How do we take the lessons we've learned and the positive things that have happened during COVID-19, and there's a lot of positive things that have happened, and build that into our memory banks and make sure that we, we apply all of that to uh, the next influenza vaccine or the next, uh, whatever the next pandemic is going to be, whatever pathogen that's going to turn out to be. There's all kinds of examples where we'd like to be able to predict the future based on the past, not the least of which is, um, can we develop universal vaccines? Based on understanding the sequence of viruses, whether they're a coronavirus like SARS-CoV-2, or whether they're an influenza virus, based on knowing the sort of sequence of these family of viruses and anticipating what the next one's going to look like. What are the sequences that are conserved in the whole family that can't be changed because they aren't changed? On COVID, for example, I was surprised that the mRNA vaccine uh, would do as well as it has done. We've never had an mRNA vaccine before, but it looks like those uh, are, are doing really well so far. So you have an mRNA vaccine, you have uh, adenovirus vectors, uh, you have inactivated virus uh, not being pursued in the United States, but in China, and that seems to be producing results. So, you know, the lesson there is you're gonna to have to try a wide range of things because it's very hard to predict precisely which one of those is gonna be the winner. I hope what we learn from COVID will be relevant to what we need to know to be able to maximize the probability of success for an mRNA approach to influenza. Um, but these are pretty early days in that, in that platform right now, so much to learn. Solving this pandemic is going to be all about global collaboration. Uh, and I mean global, not just collaboration, but global collaboration. There's amazing collaboration going on because it's a crisis between academic scientists and industry scientists, between academics and industry, between those two groups and government, and between those three groups and regulators uh, and, and funders. And, it, and to an extent that we've never seen before. And so, you know, one hopes that, that that spirit of global collaboration will continue once we solve this pandemic, which we will. We've, we've definitely run through the drill, right? You know, we've tested all parts of the system. We know where there, there's re uh, resilience and we know where there, there are fracture lines that need to be fixed. The things that have worked really well are where there have been people who are either already being connected to each other or people who will facilitate those connections. Yeah, I think what we've learned from COVID that informs the UIV is that this tripartite system of industry, academia, and the government is, is underappreciated. And we need to get all three of those parties to appreciate and respect the role that each of them plays. It's not enough to just write down the mRNA sequence of the vaccine. Uh, you have to be able to make it. You have to be able to get the trials done. You have to be able to approve it. You have to be able to manufacture it. And none of these entities can do it by themselves. Uh, we've, we've seen it's been clumsy, but it's come together, uh, hopefully, uh, in COVID. And if it's gonna come together around a universal flu vaccine, 
we're going to need to sustain that appreciation that we've developed over the last six months. When there's an outbreak, that's urgent. We invest, we do what is necessary to respond. And then when the crisis resolves, we back away from that and we either go on to the next newest crisis or we relax because finally it's over and we can breathe a sigh of relief. That's a normal human tendency. We do need the decision makers who are accountable for our preparedness to be able to sustain their focus. And for those people, it really becomes a long-term important activity. Less urgent, more long-term, more important. And that requires sustained investment, not just of money, but money is a major issue in, in long-term preparedness but also in terms of leadership, strategy, and the ability to continuously improve on the execution of that strategy as you go forward. So I think a, a really important lesson is to fund the research, to maintain sustained funding in important areas of science, not simply when there's a fire, but uh, when the fire's put out, um, how do we make sure the fire doesn't happen again? Because if we learn one thing from SARS, we learn that we're all in this together. And we really are only as strong as our weakest link. So that's a tall order, it takes a long time, but that's what we really mean about the cycle of crisis and complacency. That we have to stop thinking about these events that way and move more, in a sense, to accepting the fact that they're going to continue to occur and then step up and figure out now what really makes sense here in terms of solving this, this preparedness dilemma long term. We, we've shown we can all work together. That same mentality should now be an intensity transferred to flu to make a universal influenza vaccine. Absolutely. And I've, we've shown with COVID we can do it. We just need to be incentivized to do it, I think. And that incentive should not be the pandemic. It should be something prior to the pandemic. And there's also technical, some technical challenges with UIV that really are, um, you know, are real, that are nonetheless, you know, I think the science is there, so I think we can do it, but we just need the will. There are some great lessons, uh, and they're kind of, in hindsight, obvious lessons, uh, uh, but how do we make sure that we learn from it so that the next time we don't make the same mistakes or some future politician or some future uh, you know, organization doesn't make the same mistakes. Um, uh, I think we just keep reminding ourselves about it. We keep writing about it. Uh, so it does become hardwired. What, what we need to do is constantly be recording this pandemic in a way that allows us to have, you might say, a black box for every day. And when the pandemic's over, we pull those thousands of black boxes out of wherever they are around the world and use them to reconstruct what happened and to allow us then to say what can never happen again and this is how we're going to make sure it doesn't.